So I'd like to welcome to the Wayback Country Jamboree today a lady who has just become the newest member of the Grand Ole Opry, named the First Lady of Bluegrass Music as well as the Queen of Bluegrass Music, having got her start in the mid-70s as a young child and growing up to follow her dreams all the way to the Opry. Please welcome to the show today the newest member of the Grand Ole Opry, Miss Rhonda Vincent. Hello! Well, it's a pleasure to be talking to you, Miss Vincent. Would you prefer Rhonda or Miss Vincent? Rhonda is really is just great, and I what a wonderful introduction. I appreciate that. Thank you. Well, I'm, I'm, it's a pleasure to be talking to the newest member of the Opry. Sure. So it's so fun. You know, you're only the second person that I've heard that got that I've uh, has introduced me like that so far. So I can't wait to many, for many more. Well, I hope so. <laughs> so let's go back to 1962 in Green Top, Missouri. What are your earliest musical memories growing up? Well, I grew up in a musical family, so there are, I mean, there's a lot of memories, but uh, the ironic thing is one of my earliest childhood memories was standing in line get, trying to get into the Ryman Auditorium. Okay. My family attended a show there, and I mean, here we are from Greentop, Missouri, we made the trip to Nashville to, to be at the Ryman, and a gentleman put me up on his shoulders because my father had a car wreck when I was two, oh. was paralyzed and not expected to live, oh, wow. and so he could not hold me, and I think a gentleman saw that. My dad walked with a cane, and there we were standing for so very long, it was so hot, and he put me up on his shoulders, and so I can remember going to the Ryman and seeing String Bean, I think because that uh, outfit was so outrageous that yes. that's probably why... It's ingrained in my memory. But, you know, I grew up in this musical family, five generations of the Vincent family uh, in northern Missouri, and music was so prevalent. I mean, once I got school age, my dad picked me up from school each day. We played till dinner, and after dinner, friends came over, and we played till bedtime. So this was a nightly, there was a nightly music party. A lot of people would say that would be the coolest, and it really was for a while till I got to be a teenager, and I told this story on the Grand Ole Opry Saturday night during yes, my induction that, sure you know, when I got to be a teenager and I found out that the others were at the skating rink, it wasn't so cool anymore. Yes, and uh, I understand that you also told something on the Opry Saturday night that really touched home and kind of, with my father not being that well with dialysis, it really hit home to me. But I remember the oh. same as you, going out to the fields or what have you and listening to the car radio trying to get that scratchiness in t that was WSM. It didn't matter how much static it was. Exactly. It didn't matter if we could just barely hear it. We hung on every note and we hung on every word just trying to take to hear who was on the Opry and, and to enjoy that that moment in time. That's for sure, and I did the same. It really brought back tears to my eyes to think of that. Yeah. Oh. <laughs> so you weren't the only one crying Saturday night. <laughs> oh my goodness! Oh. Yeah. <laughs> I didn't. I didn't think of the other people who probably experienced the same thing. Yes, we sure did. A lot of us did. Yeah. So your musical career yeah. started at age five with the Sally Mountain Show. Yes, yep. Five generations be before that, you know, playing the music. And it was my grandpa, my mom and dad, aunt Catherine, Uncle Pearl, uh, cousins and friends. And, and we were the Vincent family, but then we had a television show. And that's when they changed our name because there was more than just the Vincent family. They changed yeah. it to the Sally Mountain Show. Okay. And what were those early days of music like for you? Well, we did this. We did a weekly radio show, so yeah. at least once a week we had the reel-to-reel -reel tape, and we when they moved the kitchen table back toward the stove, and and we set one microphone up, and we gathered around that microphone to record our radio show. Friday mornings at I believe around five o'clock we played on the the farm for the farm report. So we had a television show every Friday morning too, and then we would we also made our our first recording when I was five. We went to Kansas City, so yeah. that's the first documentation of my singing and okay. and my family playing. And well, you, you know what? I take that back. When my dad was thirteen. Yes. They recorded the Vincent family, so that it even goes back earlier. The recording, but that was my first recording. Amazing. Was 1967. Okay. 
and you were discovered by the legendary late King of Pop-A-Top, Jim Ed Brown. Yes, I did his, the show You Can Be a Star, and he was the host. And next thing I know, two weeks later, I was working for him. I, I traveled with him. I didn't stop traveling with my family. When Jim Ed wasn't working, I would fly into a festival and, and perform with my family, too. Okay, yes. And what was Jim so Ed I, like? I was kind of playing both ways and continued to play with my family at the same time. Yes, so you had the best of both worlds. <laughs> I sure did. I sure did. So what was Jim Ed like for those who never got to meet him? You know, for me, he was one of the kindest gentlemen. Mm -hmm. I mean, here's a perfect example. The first night I'm with him, we, the first appearance I made with Jim Ed was on the Grand Ole Opry. Mm -hmm. And he was the host of the show, and he did. we did a song. And then we stepped to the side of the stage waiting for the, you know, he introduced the other people because he was a hold of the host of that whole segment. Yeah. He introduced everybody. And, and as he introduced the first guest, he came and stood by me and he goes, you're going to do the next song. What are you going to do? Uh -huh. So he gave me an opportunity on my first, you know, this is one of the first times I had not only um, ever been away from my family musically, but uh, that I had been away from my family period just yes. being completely in another town mm -hmm. you know you, i didn't have the security of my family around and when he and i never dreamed that on my first night of you know i'm just mesmerized being in nashville tennessee number one then i'm at the grand Ole Opry and i'm performing with jim ed brown <laughs> and then he says hey you're gonna do the next song it's like what wow. yeah. but, you know he was so, so kind and and allowed me to like he would he wanted me to i played fiddle and mandolin on the show with him, mm -hmm. singing harmony with him, I was featured. Um, he he was like a, a really great mentor. You know, he said you really need to be in Nashville, yeah. and, and just you know took the time to. He, he was he was more than just hey, he's the guy I work for. He truly took an interest and said, you know, spent the time to tell me this is what you need to do, and, yes. and was a, a kind of a guy you know a guided me on the way I needed to, to go. Okay. And then in the 70s and 80s, you made it big in the bluegrass field, which at the time was, if I'm maybe as ignorant to say, a male-dominated genre? Well, yeah. Now, during the 70s and 80s, that would have been my family. I was traveling with my... It okay. became my mom and dad and I. Yes. Yeah. Now, in the 90s, maybe I misunderstood the year you're talking about. Okay. But yeah, in the 90s, then, that's when I put my first band together. Yes. And, well, first I did five, five years I was in country music with James Stroud, learning from the best of the best, James Stroud, okay. um, Jack McFadden, Stan Barnett. You know, I, um, I did two country albums, kind of, that was not a great success, but mm -hmm. it was a great learning experience for me, which when I got the chance then, after that, it was like, it was like my musical college years. And it's like, okay, well, what, what am I going to do with my life? What direction what, am I going to do? Country music? I put together my first a group of friends, and we played a few festivals, and I just discovered I'd never been happier. And it was it was one of those things of I feel like I was in the right place at the right time. Yeah. And the next thing you know, I uh, recorded, I released my first album. I won my first International Bluegrass Music Association Female Vocalist of the year mm -hmm. and I signed a, a sponsorship with Martha White yes. and I really feel like the thing that that was a pivotal moment is the Wall Street Journal reviewed that album yes it was January of 2000 and they said Rhonda Vincent the new queen of bluegrass yeah and it's just kind of a, a fun <laughs> title that stuck from there okay and what has that honor meant to you over the years so that title well, it's been just a, a, a kind of an identifier. It's people say, oh, um, and, and at first some people, now some people will say, oh, that's self-proclaimed. It's like, no, 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 it's not self-proclaimed at all. Mm -hmm. But you know, it's just, it's something that's very fun. And then I end up writing the song, All American Bluegrass Girl. So yes. it just have these, somebody said the other, yesterday, said, you have so many titles. You're an All American Bluegrass Girl, a Bluegrass Queen, or, you know, mm -hmm. whatever you, whatever they would like to call it but mandolin yeah. mama some people call me that so <laughs> i just think it's a it's just a fun thing and and people seem to catch that they're catchy and people um they um catch on to that exactly. bob everhart has a has an organization and they said you know what you need to be crowned officially so 
they had a ceremony and they got this I have this beautiful crown that they presented to me oh amazing so yes. that was that kind of made it more of a reality, I guess, versus, you know, it's a story that says you're the new queen of bluegrass, but they said no. So I have this beautiful crown, and, and it's, people come to my house, and they always have to get a picture with the crown, and, and just they have fun with it. Sure. Now, in the early days of your career, you, I understand, also recorded with Charlie Leuven, I believe it was, in New Dreams and Sunshine. That's right. That was 1985, 86. Okay. And I called him and because I loved that song. My dad, we heard him sing it on the Opry, and mm -hmm. my dad and I would sing it, and my brother, Darren. And when I got ready, I said, well, I'm going to record that. And when I did, they, I just decided to call him up, and he came in and was gracious enough. He became a, such a dear friend to our my family. He even several times drove to Queen City, Missouri, to my family's festival. Amazing. And just to, just to camp for the weekend. Yes. Yes. And uh, I mean, who does that? He's Charlie Lubin, right? That's right, exactly. <laughs> For an up and coming star, that was, uh, it would have been, I, I could only imagine what it would have been like, Rhonda. Yes. Right, a great honor. Exactly. Great honor to have him there. And do you have any memories of Bill Monroe? I know you wrote a song about him. Oh, yes. Oh, yes. Well, I didn't write that song, but that's a, what a great song. It's a tribute to him. Yes. And, well, I met him. I have. I have a picture with him, and I think I must have been around 9, 10, well, no, I would have been 11, maybe 11 or 12. Okay. But it was difficult for my dad to get around. Yes. I just I just realized this the other day when I saw this picture. It was very difficult for my dad to get around. Mm -hmm. and, my, and I remember my dad walking down this tremendous gravel hill, which mm -hmm. had to be very hard for him. He took me... Me, my dad and I, and he took us backstage. Bill Monroe was standing there with his mandolin waiting to go on stage. Just no one around him. And my dad went over, and he, my dad would have had to have taken this picture. I can't tell you another picture he would have taken, but that tells me how important that was for him yes. to make sure that I met the father of bluegrass music. So 11, 12 years old, my dad made that trip down the hill, took me back and introduced us to Bill Monroe, and you know what, he, Bill had invited us several times, we got to play Nashville, he had a bluegrass night um, before Fanfare started on a Tuesday night, and we played that a few times. We were always so excited to get to come to Nashville and, and play that show. So, and you okay. know, one of my, last time I saw Bill Monroe was at the Opry, yes. and this was just, I don't think it was that far before he passed. He was there, I rounded the corner, and he grabbed me, and there happened to be a photographer, and got a picture. And that ended up in the Country Weekly magazine, I think, or one of those one of those magazines. I so cherish that photo because that's the last time I saw Bill Monroe. I see, yes. And I didn't get to go to his I didn't get to go to his funeral, but I did. I walked to uh, or I went downtown Nashville. I just happened to be in Nashville, mm -hmm. and I walked into the Ryman, and they were allowing people to you know to walk through. Well, his funeral was at the Ryman Auditorium. And they had the casket there, and they and I didn't. He didn't ever give me a quarter. People say he gave everybody. He carried quarters, yes. and they had the caskets just lined with all of these quarters. And that was the first time that I had heard about that. And I was like, "Wow, that's that's pretty unique." But mm -hmm. I'm glad I did. I get to. I did get to go there and pay my respects. Okay. And so, would you tell us about that song? Is the grass any bluer? Well, it was written by Corey Batten, and I. My, it leaves me who the other two were. Some okay. of Nashville's great songwriters got together, and they were doing a writing session, and Bill Monroe had just passed, and they said, we've got to write a song about this. He was the father of bluegrass, and we need to write a song. And that particular day uh, he, that they wrote that song. So Corey Batten had came to Nashville and had, you know, he was trying to make it as a songwriter. He told me later on, and now he's a very successful songwriter. At that time, he had his car packed up, and he was getting ready to leave Nashville. He was giving up on songwriting. Okay. And just as he, either the day before or something, he said the car was like, well, he was literally ready to leave town. And they called him and said, Rhonda Vincent has just put your song on hold. She's going to record your song. So yes. I was the first cut that he ever had, and he is... It's like, wow, what a, and he said it inspired him so much, he did not leave. He stayed that's here, and great. now he's had, he's had many hits. Yes. So that's kind of neat to know that you really influence somebody's life like that, just exactly. by recording a song. 
Yes, and you've been inspired me because, again, my father uh, introduced me to your music at a young age, and uh, I have him to thank for this uh, uh, this song being one of my memories of yours and mine. Yeah. Oh, yes. that's great. Yes. So Saturday night you became the newest inductee to the world-famous Grand Ole Opry. It was a year in the making. What has this honor meant like, and has it sunk in yet? Well, I'm still kind of floating around. Yes. <laughs> because it was so incredible. It, was, uh, it, it wasn't what we all expected, because it was 343 days after the invitation. They said this is the first time that's ever happened. And uh, so it was unique in several respects that it, we, I waited so very long for this induction. It mm -hmm. was, you know, with the uh, social distancing, we, it wasn't, I wasn't, my family was there, but it wasn't like I was surrounded by family. We were isolated in our, in our room until we got to walk on stage. Thankfully, I was surrounded, my family, I could see them in, in, in the audience, yes. and I was surrounded by my band. But it was, you know, that part of it was a little different. Usually, you know, a year ago, when you went to the Opry, there's all, there's the hustle and bustle of everyone backstage, there's yes. jam sessions going on, and it's just a really a wonderful atmosphere. So there was a few oddities like that, that, you know, you couldn't, there was no one backstage, mm -hmm. it was this stark, um, you know, silence backstage. I see. And it was like the plaque ceremony, luckily my family got to come to the plaque ceremony where I, I got to put my... Uh, you know, put the plaque on the wall. And you know what's really, really awesome is my plaque is right next to my brother's on Dara. It says with Daly and Vincent. And so those two plaques say Vincent, and then the next plaque says Vincent. Vincent. Great. That's great. That is so special. It sure is. Now, uh, I have a couple more questions for you today, Rhonda, and then can I get a promo? Okay. You sure can. So our next question is, what is your advice for people wanting to grow up to follow their dreams, as obviously you have? My greatest advice is to take every time to play and sing and, you know, perfect your craft. And do, make sure, you know, that you are, you're playing, you're singing, and, and you're, you're doing the very best that you can possibly do. Okay. That's very, very important. Um, a great life lesson. Uh, the best advice I can give somebody is a life lesson that I learned. Now, I grew up with my family. We were at Silver Dollar City, mm -hmm. and it's, uh, you know, they're in Branson, Missouri. Yes. And we now we played there five days a week, five one-hour shows a day, and then we went to festival on the weekend. So we're playing our show, and it's pouring down rain, and there's no one out there. We can see no one. No one's uh, listening. Darren and I are like, Dad, let's just wait until the rain stops, you know, and then we'll play. And Dad says, no, they're paying us to play, and we're going to play, yes. whether there's anybody out here or not. The next week, we got a call from Hal Durham, and he was the general manager of oh, the Grand Ole Opry at that yes. time. He said, uh, Mr. Vincent, I'd like to invite you and your family to come play on the Opry. And we thought we had just met Charlie Leuven, and we thought that Charlie had recommended us. My dad said, uh, we'd like to thank Charlie for recommending us for the Opry, and, and Hal said, um, Charlie had nothing to do with this. And my dad said, well, how in the world did you know about my family? Exactly. He said, uh, last week, while your family was playing in the rain, he said, I was on vacation with my family, and we were around the corner listening. Amazing. So yeah. that is the single greatest uh, life lesson to me, that whatever you do, perfect your skill. I mean, it doesn't have to even be music, but whatever you're going to do, do it to your very best. And, you know, no matter what, because you never know who's listening or who's watching. So what does the future hold for the newest member of the Grand Ole Opry? Well, I've been working on a new album now for a couple of years since this. It was supposed to have been released a year ago. Oh, and yes. so I continue to work on it. And I think we've decided I was going to wait till we started touring again full time. But uh, I think it's time. I think with this Opry induction, I think it's time that we release some new music. So coming very soon, we're going to have a brand new album coming out. Well, that sounds great, Rhonda. I want to thank you for being on the show today, and congratulations from the Wayback Country Jamboree and all the Woodlock family to you. I want to thank you for a thank wonderful you. interview, and uh, hopefully our, our paths cross some way, somewhere down the road. I sure hope so. You take care, and blessings to you. Thank you. God bless you. Bye-bye. Thank you. Thank you. Bye.